of Rip City Scholars Center for Rehabilitation and Employment. This presentation is uh, being conducted by Preston Wirtz, uh, Brianna Gommel, Andrew Kurtz, and Rebecca Rawson. So take it away. All right. Thank you for that great introduction. As Professor Byron pointed out, we are group number 21, the Rip City Scholars. And today we will be presenting on our applied innovation for our challenge statement that was decent work. And we are, so we have titled it, the Rip City Scholars Center for Rehabilitation and Employment. I'm Preston Wirtz. I'm Aubriana Gommel. Andrew Kurz. And I'm Rebecca Rawson. Our group has chosen to take on the challenge of decent work and more specifically research prison rehabilitation programs because of the United States high percentage of convicted citizens. The United States has an incarcerated population of over 2.3 million. Of that 2.3 million, 41,000 are Wisconsin, Wisconsin residents alone, meaning that Wisconsin has an incarceration rate of 606 per 100,000 people. Over 56% of the U.S. incarcerated population are African American and Hispanic Americans. Wisconsin, by percentage, has the highest incarceration rate for African American men of over 13%. This graph with statistics taken from the 2010 census helps to better illustrate the racial disparities in Wisconsin incarceration rates. It is clear to see that the black population has significantly higher incarceration rates in comparison to each other racial group, though are followed by American Indian and Alaskan natives. Causes of these overall high incarceration rates and apparent racial disparities are the large emphasis on low-level drug offenses and overall heavy reliance on reincarceration tactics like the Three Strikes Law. The Three Strikes Law was created in order to drastically increase the punishment of those convicted of more than two serious crimes, often resulting in life in prison. Misdemeanors may count towards these three strikes, and many states have some form of the policy which has greatly helped contribute to the United States large prison population. Outside of the three strikes law, strict sentencing protocol result in the largest portion of reincarceration. This graph from the Bureau of Justice Statistics helped to better, better illustrate the sheer amount of incarcerations resulting from parole or probation violations. The yellow bar in each graph represents the number of incarcerations resulting from parole and probation violations. This means that each one of those arrests was not caused by any new crime, but rather a violation of rules that are set in place all too often in order to further fuel the cycle of crime and keep people in prisons rather than positively integrate them back into society. We believe that this is a pattern that must be changed because too many prisons today are severely overcrowded and underfunded and far too many inmates are being mistreated and alienated upon their release. Rather than starting with any policy change proposals, we believe that creating a stronger support network for current inmates and better preparing them to reassimilate back into society is an essential aspect of decreasing incarceration rates. In particular, we believe that by better preparing inmates to find and keep decent work after release is the best way to go about this. All right, so as Becky pointed out, we have kind of highlighted three main issues that we see with the prison system today. These are racial disparity, lack of uh, decent work upon release, and reincarceration. So our group has focused on looking into two types of solutions that target some aspect of these three limitations within the prison system. The first type we have labeled as within prison solutions, and the other type is community-based within prison solutions place an emphasis on education as a means for making uh, prisoners more desirable in the job market and limit reincarceration rates. Community-based solutions take another approach that focuses on providing decent work while not focusing so much on the mission of themselves. Specifically, our group has looked into two within prison studies targeted at rehabilitation. The first study was the three states recidivism that targeted education for prisoners in Ohio, Minnesota, and Maryland. This study attempted to use a controlled setting by creating two groups within each of these three prisons. There were those that were, would receive the education rehabilitation program and those that would not. 
Overall, the study used over 3,000 inmates. The participants in the program underwent an educational program monitored by the Correctional Education Association and was funded by the U.S. Department of Education. After completion of the program, the study followed the released inmates for a period of three years and studied reincarceration rates. The study found significant evidence suggesting that the prisoners that chose to take the education rehabilitation program were statistically less likely to end up reincarcerated. The next within prison solution we looked into was the Kintak Group Incorporated. This was a nonprofit organization aimed at preventing and reducing criminal activity. The group used a rehabilitation technique defined by substance abuse treatment, home placements, employment referrals, and employment counseling. The group also found great success, indicating that their program had a 72% success rate, which was defined by reincarceration rates, than compared to a comparison group that was just given a standard parole condition. Each of these within prison or parole solutions show that any intervention within the prison can be helpful. These solutions work under the assumption that a prison's or parole's program's main focus should be on rehabilitation. However, this is not always the case with all prisons and jails, and for some prisons, much more emphasis is placed on security rather than rehabilitation. Our applied innovation takes a similar assumption of a program based on counseling and education as hallmarks of a solution, but combines these with employment support to address the concern that rehabilitation programs may not be effective for economic and societal support. For a solution focused on providing work for ex-prisoners, our group has began looking into the Delancey Street Foundation. The Delancey Street Foundation is a residential organization for former inmates, drug abusers, or homeless ind individuals. Businesses created by the Delancey Street in Foundation include cafes, moving companies, and bookstores. All organizations created by the Delancey Street Foundation feature former inmates as employers and decision makers for the businesses. The Delancey Street Foundation offers a real life example of providing a two-fold solution to the issue relating to released prisoners having little job or housing prospects upon release. Through this, the Delancey Street Foundation has become one of the leading self-help organizations and has made real changes in big cities like San Francisco. However, the Delancey Street Foundation does have some limitations. Right now, the Delancey Street Foundation is based in larger cities. Something like the Delancey Street Foundation may be more difficult to implement into smaller rural communities that we are looking into like Green Lake. Additionally, the foundation does not provide counseling or, sound, or social work and instead relies on a pure work and housing program that expects its members to get clean from the influence of the other members. This get tough approach can cause some members to quit the program. It is our intention to create a solution similar to the Delancey Street Foundation that can act as a self-sufficient program, providing decent work, but be more accessible to a larger population and ensure that the needs of all of our members are being met. We are also planning on targeting our members earlier, specifically within the prison, as a way of making sure that the transition from incarceration to employment is as smooth as possible. In summary, we find that the problem is twofold. Prisoners, through, often, through lack of education and community support, do not often make desirable employees, and society also has an adverse reaction to the success of ex-convicts in the workplace. Our solution is meant to use these findings as a catalyst for creating a prison program that doubles as a rehabilitation center and employment-focused program. So we now introduce the RIP City Center uh, for Rehabilitation and Employment. Our program will be primarily focused on providing and setting up ways for our members to receive decent work. The program will occur entirely while the members are still in prison and will consist of 15 members at each location that we set up. First, the program will include a comprehensive approach in combining education, employment opportunities, and counseling. Our program will rely on an education to get members to a high school degree or equivalent. Educators will consist of trained educational providers that will go within to the prisons or jails to teach. Based on the limited availability of the educators, all members that choose to do the educational part of our program will be taught together. 
Appointment opportunities are the most important aspect to our solution. Upon entry into our program, members will be matched with an employer partner in our program that will meet with, advise, provide internships, and hopefully eventually jobs for our members. Finally, social counseling will be given to all members to ensure continued support and encourage a smooth transition to outside life. The program will begin for members at different points in their sentence due to the variability of our members. So the length of the program will follow the members from whatever point they begin the program to at least a month or two after to make sure that they are integrated properly. This is really the applied innovative aspect of our solution. It takes chance out of the equation by ensuring that our solution sees our members through to every aspect of our solution. From incarceration to education to employment, our program has precautions in place to ensure that no members fall through the cracks. As such, we have decided to focus our solution to two criminal detainment facilities in Wisconsin. For an urban perspective, we have chosen to look into Milwaukee and for a rural solution, we have began focusing on the Green Lake Jail. We plan for the Green Lake Jail to be the first to implement our program and then expand to the Milwaukee prisons and other prisons around Wisconsin if we are successful. Potential businesses have been contacted around Ripon, Wisconsin and the surrounding areas to see if there would be community interest and if our implementation could be realistic. Of the businesses in Ripon, our group would like to partner with the Ripon Pickle Factory, Alliance Laundry, and AFK Foundry. These three businesses would serve as the foundation for our Green Lake program. All three of these corporations offer decent work to community members in Ripon and the surrounding areas and are some of the biggest employers for the city of Ripon. All of these companies offer equal opportunity and value teamwork and responsibility as employment qualifications. Emails have been sent to each of these companies regarding their experience with hiring or working with people who have been jailed or incarcerated, um, how big a factor criminal record is, and whether employees would be able to support themselves financially through a baseline position at their respective company. Our intention is for these businesses to send representatives to our program that will act as the mentors and employers to our members. These three businesses would each receive five members depending on job interest and would meet with, get to know, and discuss employment opportunities during or after jail sentence. These employees would then meet up regularly with the members, get to know them, integrate them into their community, and provide work. So our program is going to run on an application process meant to pick out the best candidates at each of our facilities. Our program is going to consist of 15 members at all locations. Our program, our application process will include demographic questions, crime history, a personal statement detailing why they want to be a part of the program, and job history and, and interest so we know which of our employers we will match them with. We will not discriminate against anyone when admitting inmates into our program, and acceptance will be completely merit-based. Employees of the RIP City Scholar Center for Rehabilitation and Education will work with uh, project mentors and employers to decide who gets accepted. Program employers will meet with social workers within the jails and prisons directly to ensure that some of the best candidates are not being turned away just because of our application process. We have formed the system to account for some inmates having an adverse opinion of people coming into the jails and prisons and expecting to know their best interest. Next, I'm gonna talk about staffing for a little bit. So creating a solution of this caliber will require some additional staffing from around the community. Our group is intending on hiring at least 10 individuals at each of our locations. The employees will come from a variety of background and will be filled through an application process. Our group is intending on having at least one program coordinator at each location that acts as the manager to ensure that the program is being run effectively. Members will also be matched with counselors and to ensure that the individual needs of all of our members are being met, no more than five members should be assigned to any one counselor. If an education program is not already established at each location, certified educators will need to be hired and trained to provide quality the education to our members. The remaining employees will be individuals that will continue looking for ways to expand the program at each of our locations. Their job may include meeting with additional employers, reviewing applications and accepting other members, and will aid in coordinating the other aspects of our program. Finally, I'm going to talk about 
our outcome measurement and expansions. So to ensure the success of our program, we will expect detailed updates back and forth from our program counselors and employers regarding the conditions of our members. Bi-weekly meetings will be had with the members, counselors, and employers. If the facility offers work release, members will begin training for their matched employer or even begin working. If an employer chooses not to hire our member due to any circumstance, our employees will do the best they can to match our member with another employer or find more potential businesses to hire them. Our job success will be measured as the number of individuals that receive a job within a couple of weeks from release of prison or jail. As stated prior, we plan on implementing our solution in Green Lake first. And then if this is successful, we plan to use this as leverage for implementing our program into a prison. Specifically, we are looking into Milwaukee. Our end goal is to implement some sort of employment program into all jails and prisons across Wisconsin. So one of the potential barriers to our solution is funding. Um, we have done research for grants and one that we found was the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant. And this grant supports programs within a variety of topics, including crime prevention, education, mental health programs, and correctional programs. And since our solution is a rehabilitation and employment center based around the prison system, um, we definitely feel that this grant would work for us. We also believe that we could qualify for a more educational oriented grant as well, based on the fact that part of our solution is an educational system for the prisoners. Um, for other sources of funding, we also like the ideas of unpaid internships as incentive for businesses to fund our program and also the possibility of reallocating the funds of the prison. Um, next is political slash government intervention, as this could be a potential barrier to how long our solution uh, could be sustainable. And this also sort of corresponds with public support as well and not wanting these prisoners within their community. Um, but we are very aware that we may have to persuade people into getting on board with our solution, but we really feel that people will sympathize with these prisoners and the belief that these people deserve a second chance. Um, another barrier is finding businesses to employ the prisoners. And as, prison, as Preston had talked about a little earlier, this is something we are currently working on as we have contacted a couple of businesses across Ripon to see where they stand on hiring prisoners. Um, but again, we are prepared to in order to be able to persuade people into getting on our side. And lastly is approval from the prisons. Um, we had a meeting with Professor Hatcher, who is a psychology professor that has experience within the prison system. And he really preached how the prison's number one priority is obviously security. So we believe that if we could work with the prisons and devise a way that is safe and that they feel good about, that this won't be an issue. Uh, next is the assumptions to our solution. And the first is that the prisoners will be interested in a program like this. Um, obviously, we believe that they will. Um, with them being in prison for however long they have been, we think that the opportunity to sort of work outside of those grounds would really excite them. Um, we think that they uh, the, giving the opportunity to work outside would be good for them. And also, Professor Hatcher really talked about how they, they feel like the outside world has really kind of forgotten about them. And that if they find out that we're you know devising a program for them in order to work outside of the prison and just be free would be something that they would really appreciate and that would excite them uh, next is community support and compliance from businesses and that's very similar to our barriers so i'll just kind of reiterate that we are assuming that the community and surrounding businesses um, would be willing to work with us um, but again we think that there are good people out there who will support us uh, next is assuming that employees will be willing to work within our system uh, our education program to provide high school degree, degrees to the prisoners uh, will need teachers and our mental health programs to provide the prisoners with people to talk to about their issues will need social workers. So we are assuming that people will be willing to do this work. Uh, lastly is assuming that the prisoners will do good in these positions. Um, whatever job we end up finding for them, we are assuming that they will be good, hardworking employees. And on top of that, we are assuming that they will you know, have good social interactions with their empl other employees and also the people that they are serving. And we think that our application process will be a big factor into why this is successful in finding the prisoners who are going to work hard and that are mentally prepared to take on these roles. And that is why we assume that our solution will be successful. 
Overall, we hope that our solution will have a multitude of benefits on society, though in particular, hope to overall decrease free incarceration rates and in turn, help to lessen racial disparities within incarceration rates. We also hope to improve quality of life for past inmates after release, decrease unemployment rates within populations of felons, and ultimately, positively change how felons of, are thought of and treated by proving that when given a second chance, they really can make a good impact on society. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Erin, do you, you want to start out with a question? Oh, well, I was just going to remind everyone in the room that if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat or speak up. We will take questions in either way. Um, I have like a very simple question to start off with. Uh, could you remind me what RIP at the beginning of your title stands for? RIP? Is that for Rippin or for Rest in Peace? Yes, it's for Rippin. It okay. kind of started out as our just joke group name. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. I was sort of wondering if there would be a way to involve Ripon College students in this program at administration or some sort of internship, work study. If yeah, that that's actually possible. something we talked with Professor Hatcher about. And he told us that he had tried um, something similar before, like involving Ripon College and had issues um, with uh, the prisons wanting to work with us, actually. Oh. Okay. So I have another question to kind of tag along with that. Um, I think um, there are already some educational opportunities to get your GED in prison. And I'm wondering um, how will your program add on to that? Um, and another thing is um, would students be willing to I, I guess it's more that whether the prisons are allowed to work with us, whether as opposed to whether students are willing to work inside prisons. I'm sorry. So you're kind of wondering like what we're adding on to the uh, educational facility or educational programs at these places? Yes. Right. So um, we're looking at kind of like combining like a three step sort of process, although they're all kind of intertwined at the same time where um, the educational program, if it is there, we, we just want our members all to be at around a GED or, or its equivalent. And then in addition to that, we are also planning on like matching them with employers. So that way we can have them have a better chance of getting a job upon release from prison and then also potentially uh, social counseling. There's a question in chat. Uh, you talked uh, from Kai. You talked a little bit about the application process. Have you put any thought into what incentives prisoners would have to fill out such applications, considering that it would require prisoners to be self advocates? I think that's a really good question. I don't know if we've specifically looked into that. If I'm thinking off of the top of my head, I would say maybe we make them aware of like what job opportunities uh, they could be matched with. And I think that could serve as an incentive. It's a, if it's like an, a job that they have experience with, if it's a job that they might like. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say about incentives for that. So I have a question about uh, privatization of prisons. Is it in the interest of the profit sector for this to happen? for-profit prisons? Oh, are you saying like would for-profit prisons like benefit from our solution? Sure, or would you? Would it be harder to maybe even convince them to, to play along? I, I do think that could have a role if, if, um, if we are implementing this into for-profit prisons because I don't know what incentives they would have for adding a program like this into it given that a lot of like uh, a big part of our program is kind of like providing opportunities for the members which kind of goes against like the primary purpose of what a for-profit prison would be to do 
There's another question in chat from Michelle Whitler. Are there direct incentives from the US or state governments for businesses to hire ex-convicts? Maybe not. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think Andrew could maybe talk about the, I think that kind of goes along with our barriers a little bit where it's like that could be a potential barrier. I, I do feel like there are probably, I think like tax breaks might be something that uh, some uh, uh, like uh, businesses might get for hiring ex-convicts. Yeah, I didn't look into that too much. I do remember reading over something about Preston said there are some incentives to it, like a tax break, but I didn't do too much research into it. We also hope too that the addition of our unpaid internships as well will be an incentive for businesses in particular to work with us and hire ex-convicts. I do have a, I have another question. So I, I see in a couple of states, I think in California just passed a law called ban the box where employment applications are not allowed to ask if somebody has a previous uh, uh, conviction or incarceration. Um, could participating in your program help something like that happen in Wisconsin? I don't know whether that's a thing in Wisconsin or not. So yeah. that future employment, they won't have to say that they had been in jail. I think that's like a long-term benefit consequence that our program could potentially have. I mean, I think that's like one of our end goals is like eventually the stigma of, you know, uh, ex-convicts not being able to find work or not being desirable in the job market will hopefully go away through our, through, I mean, a lot of things, but our program could certainly help. Sure. Um, I'm also wondering, um, within your program, have you thought about, um, besides having support for the ex-convict counseling wise, does that include career counseling? Um, as in, if they're getting an education, what jobs should they be applying for? What jobs can they be applying for? That's a good question. I think for the most part, we've been focusing on what past experience the, the prisoners may have, but I think that's another really good idea that we could probably implement into our, like the social counseling part of our program. Okay, are there any other questions? All right, let's, let's thank the, our presenters and um, congratulations on a great Catalyst Day. Thank you very much.